Our political system with its inertia, its disturbances, its disruptions, its diseases, that system will take this program down and arrest it midstream. Political resistance is the capacity that Everglades Restoration has to resist those arresting forces. 2018 was not a good year for Florida's coasts, from toxic algae to red tide. If we don't do this and fix it, I mean, our tax base is going to erode. We'll have less resources 10, 15 years from now. If they keep catering to special interest groups and, and not listening to, to the public, then we're never going to get this fixed. Everglades restoration. Is it science or is it politics? From 2011, I became a fishing guide. Within 12 months, it was, you know, a full-time gig plus. And, you know, my second year was just like, I was saying no to more trips than yes, just because I had you know, a pretty full schedule. I spent 20 years building my guiding career, building my name in the industry, seeing people's experiences and recognizing their connection to the water. Seeing that through the eyes of my customers that made me so passionate about it, I think that's probably the most rewarding part. You know, I never, never thought I would have regretted it at all until the water issue started to get a lot worse. The first water crisis that I experienced as a guide was in 2013. We had really bad discharges and I had, you know, pretty much year on programs. They all got shut down. All those flats are dead. I adapted. I found other places I could fish. That was what was important to me at the time. But in 2016, it hit a lot different. We're having these massive Lake Okeechobee discharges, which were nothing new to us, but literally the whole estuary where we fished was turned from saltwater to freshwater. Beaches were littered with shells, you know, shellfish, horse conks that were crawling out of the water because it was fresh and dying in the tens of thousands on our beaches. And you would go catch bait and you'd run back to try to pick your clients up and all the bait that you just spent two hours getting all died. And your clients get on the boat and they're talking about, you know, the wife's calling that they don't want to sit on the beach with their kids because of the dead fish. And that was like the, the kind of the aha moment. Like if something doesn't change, we're not going to be able to keep guiding as we know it. Daniel called me one evening and you could tell he was he was upset, he was pissed off, he was scared. You know, he said, you know, we, we need to do something about this, we've got to do something about this. And I remember I told him, you know, Daniel, I, I agree completely, but the level of effort that I think this will take, what you're talking about is basically committing your life to it, to trying to fight this. And, you know, at the time he was like, fine, if that's what it takes, but we have to do something. We can't just continue to do nothing. When we first got involved with this, I don't think it was ever a commitment or anything beyond just kind of following anger. The beginning was like, I'll try to do this in between charters, you know, on my time off. And quickly, a matter of a few months, became apparent that there was so much opportunity to fix our waters through awareness and education that it, that was going to require that same kind of level of commitment that I had given to guiding. I guess it was a leap that whether we made that decision today or in 20 years from now, ultimately that decision would have to be faced. You either fight to change things and fix our waters or suffer the consequences. To me, it's more important to fight for something you love than worry about making money off of something you love. I don't, I don't think there was ever a, a real conversation. It was more like, this is what I'm doing. There was moments of doubt when we're six months in and they're still trying to work towards getting in front of legislators and getting in front of people who could actually incite change besides just their grassroots followers. That was when I was kind of like, is this ever going to do anything? So I think about six months in when my fiance was having to pay my boat payments and was having to pay our rent. She had enough faith in, in importance of, of what we were trying to do. But you know, when it first started, she took on three jobs to pay our bills while Daniel and I ran around the state trying to save the Everglades. They quit their jobs so that everybody didn't have to, so that we would finally have someone to do it to give us a voice. 
Mr. Moran, I'm not ashamed. As a matter of fact, I quit the job that I love, a career of 20 years, to try to fight to save it at a huge cost to me and my family. I spent the last three days in Washington, D.C. fighting to get appropriations for funds for Everglades restoration. I arrived here at 3.30 this morning, and I'm here all day, stayed longer than a couple of your board members. I'm not ashamed. I think you should be ashamed. I am a proud member of the Peanut Gallery, also known as a taxpayer and your constituents. What's the disease of our political life? An example, fake news, right? Fake news, false narratives, misinformation. Everglades restoration has to withstand all of those. The way we see it is it's a David versus Goliath battle. The natural system was manipulated and changed 100 years ago, and that change works great for the industrial sugar industry. But the counter to that is their ideal flood control and irrigation results in imbalance in the other estuaries, results in too much water during the wet season to the east and west coast, and not enough water to the Everglades and Florida Bay during the dry season. Everglades restoration does not help their business. It helps pretty much everybody else in the state of Florida. We have severe algae blooms earlier than we've ever seen them. Over a hundred times more toxic than what the EPA says is the harm threshold for human exposure. Cyanobacteria, the type that we have in our freshwater bodies, it's uh, called microcystis. The toxin it produces is microcystin. And although it's called blue-green algae, it is a cyanobacteria. It's not, you know, it's not an algae. It is a potent liver toxin. It's linked to neurodegenerative diseases, ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. In 2018 and 2016, there were dogs that drank it and died out of the St. Lucie River. There was a huge uptick in people checking in at, at the hospitals in Lee and Martin County that had respiratory issues from both the red tide and the, the cyanobacteria. So realizing that, the sugar industry fights extremely hard to keep things the way they are. They have a lot more resources than we do, multi-billion dollar a year industry, and they've hired kind of pay to play, quote, journalists to do hit pieces on us. They've created fake environmental organizations, uh, fake news outlets. They'll put out information to try to take the attention away from anything other than true Everglades restoration. I think they understand now that they're up against not just two scruffy fishing guides and, and some of their friends, I think they understand that they're up against a population of people who have finally found their voice. Seeing those kind of hit pieces and slander campaigns put out on us they make me want to fight. They make me want to fight harder and work harder. And they also at the same time let me know that what we're doing is effective. The Captains for Clean Water are the prime example of these new voices. This is Daniel Andrews and Chris Whitman. Um, these guys aren't policy people. They're not environmentalists. They're fishing guides. And in three short years, they are now operating at the highest political levels. It has become more and more clear this year that water quality is the most important thing that faces our communities here in Florida, uh, not only to sustain our way of life, but to drive a thriving uh, economy here. This isn't something where I press a button and the problem's fixed. It could be a lifetime of screaming and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and maybe it gets fixed and maybe it doesn't, but that change is possible. The way that people are effective. The only tool that, that we have as individuals to be effective against massive corporate interests is to be vocal and unified. The way that special interests, in this case sugar, combats that is to try to divide communities, to try to sow doubt through misinformation, to basically hamper that unity and that unified voice that is effective in driving change. When I started, this was a selfish effort, right? It was, it was my way of life and my job at stake, and so I was gonna fight to save that. Now, it's definitely a lot different. My wife is expecting our first child at the end of the year this year. 
That really kind of puts this, in, this effort into a whole new light for me. We're not gonna see an immediate return next year, but what we're doing today is, is really gonna benefit the next generation and the generations to come. And so now having a child on its way, I think really um, makes the work that we're doing today all that more important to me. The Everglades can recover, we just have to give it the opportunity.